Hello, and welcome to Radio IRM. This is your presenter for the day, uh, John Crowley. I am joined in the studio today in the newsroom by Emer McEnany. The production editor for today's production is Ken Porter. We're going to talk today for the next half an hour on embedding risk management. Uh, we're going to run this like a phone-in show, um, as we have with the fundamentals of risk management, which is the, the forerunner for, for this course. Uh, risk is part of life, and avoiding all risks would result in no achievement, no progress, and therefore no reward. Okay, so we're all in the business of actually taking risks, and the question is just how much do we want to take? Uh, on today's show, we're going to talk. We're going to we're going to look at a couple of things. We're going to start talking about the context of embedding risk management. A couple of issues coming out of that. The first is in, is risk treatment. Risk appetite is the, is the second. How do we integrate risk management into BAU or business as usual? And then what are the people tools that we, that, uh, that we need? Okay? But before we get into that, I just want to go over to the newsroom for a moment because we've got some news coming in from the World Economic Forum in relation to risks. And after the jingle, you're going to hear the voice of Emer McEnany. Thank you, John. As you mentioned, we're talking about the Global Risk Report for 2015 that's come in from the World Economic Forum. Um, the format of the report this year is slightly different. They've laid out the top 10 risks in terms of likelihood and the top 10 risks in terms of impact. So to take the top three in likelihood or most likely to occur, at number one, we have interstate conflict. At number two, extreme weather events followed by failure of national governance at number three. The top three in terms of impact or severity of consequences at number one is no surprise uh, with water crisis. Number two is the spread of infectious diseases. And number three is the impact of weapons of mass destruction. Um, now back to the studio. John, I understand you have been doing um, risk industry surveys and you have been getting some feedback from risk professionals. Yeah, over the last year, uh, I've been talking to various different risk professionals, and we're hearing a lot of noise, uh, issues that people have. Uh, so just for a moment, I'd just like to flash up a number of slides for, uh, for you on the sorts of things that people are telling us in relation, to, uh, in relation to risk management. So let's just have a look at these. feedback comments. Uh, if any of you were lucky enough to present to be at this year's and indeed receive an award uh, by the IRM at their uh, annual award ceremony, you will have heard this famous sentence issued by the adorable presenter Joanna Lumley when talking about risk management. She said, let me translate that into Latin to make it more understandable. Okay? And I suppose that is probably the theme of a lot of what we hear in terms of noise in risk management. So the course that we run in the IRM, Embedding Risk Management, is a follow-on or a drill down from the form course, the fundamentals of risk management. We call it advanced form. And over the course of the next half hour, we're going to look at the main topics that we cover on embedding risk management within our training. Um, so let's just start off with some queries that are, that are coming in. Uh, Imer, we have a letter in. 
Yeah, John, we have a letter in from Joe. He writes, Dear John, I have been on a form course and apparently there is a lot more to know. Can you give me the context of embedding risk management so that I can learn more? Thanks, Eva. Well, Joe, um, we'd be pleased to, to try and answer your questions. The context of embedding risk management, where do you start? There's a lot in this. So I'm going to touch on seven points in, in relation to that. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at the warrior's guide to, to, to risk. Um, so why do we get ourselves in a knot about risk management? Well, the starting point is, is usually we start worrying about it. Uh, and so what does the warrior's guide direct us through? Okay, well, the, start, the warrior's guide starts off, I suppose, with life's uncertain. We don't always know what will happen or what will happen next. Therefore, that gives rise to stress for us. Uh, evidence can mislead us. Uh, we often can't see the full picture. We are so, uh, we are so caught up with um, f focusing on where we have been led uh, to believe that a certain outcome is the only outcome. And we need to be able to stand back and think about the full picture of risk management. On the courses, we actually run some interesting exercises um, on, on, on this in relation to uh, predictive solutions and the power of suggestion and how you can very easily fall for incorrect solutions by not standing back and looking at the big picture. Then what about me? Why should I worry? Um, and in the form course, we covered a little bit around, I suppose, the, the selfish approach that people take or the narrow approach that people take to risk management. On an embedding, we're trying to, to, to get into this in a little bit more detail, and we focus quite a lot on people behaviour, and we talk a little bit about that in the next section. Can I do anything about it? Yes or no? Um, we sometimes throw our hands up in the air and say, no, we can't do anything about that, therefore we will ignore it. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes people say, yeah, everything is doable, and there are things that are not doable. Um, they would say that, wouldn't they? Um, they the, the skeptics, and one of the things that we're going to look at are, uh, in the course today, uh, or in the presentation today, is, is, is um, uh, well poisoners and supporters, and who are the people that are actually in our corner when we look at it. And I suppose it all turns down to, can we get a balance right in relation to, to, to risk management? Context uh, is also important uh, from the point of view of regulation or rules, and I'm just going to identify two. So I suppose anybody who's subject to company law, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at it from a UK point of view, from a Middle Eastern point of view, from an America's per per perspective, there will be codes of governance or codes of best conduct, generally emanating from the institute of directors of your country or enshrined in company law. And in the UK, the UK co uh, Governance Code specifies uh, some stuff in relation to risk management and embedding risk management. For those of you that are in the financial services world, which has come through significant risk turmoil over the last five years, you'll be faced with the prospect of making sure that you comply with Basel III and making sure that the capital requirements for counterparties not only just look at the actual risk, but look at risk, credit risk assessment, under stress test scenarios, etc. Um, this gentleman, Mr. Rumsfeld, uh, famously once quoted, there are no knowns, there are things we know we know, we also know there are known unknowns, that's to say, there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know, we don't know. Now, we actually missed actually one category within, within that. So let's just look at that in a little bit, uh, in a little bit more detail. If you, if you plot on a screen knowns and unknowns, there are four possible places that you could be. So from a risk management point of view, it's, it's important that we understand these. So if you start at the top right, the known knowns, um, this is the area that is relatively straightforward for risk management and you ignore this at your peril because these are things we know and therefore things that have a significant element of certainty and therefore there are things that we can do. Dropping down to the bottom right, then we have the known unknowns. Okay, So we know that uh, there are things that we don't know and therefore this is the area that we need to put training into and this is the area we need to put research into. Moving across to the bottom left, then we have the unknowns, unknowns, and from a risk management point of view, we largely have to put those into a category of 
not paying too much attention to them. Why? Because by definition, we just don't know that we don't know anything about them. Uh, Donald actually forgot the unknown knowns in his quote, and this is, uh, as we have on the slide there, where elephants lurk. So they're, it's, it's unknown to us, but they are known to others. And this is the area where, as risk managers, we can sometimes assume that these are unknown unknowns, when in actual fact they are known unknowns because of our lack of appreciation of effective risk management. You'll be familiar with the standard uh, SWOT analysis, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So just to superimpose onto, on, on, onto, onto that knowns and unknowns, the strengths and the weaknesses are generally the known knowns, and the opportunities and the threats are generally the known unknowns. Okay? So if we look at them on a chart and we think about what would our approach be to dealing with those sorts of risks? So OS means opportunities and threats and strengths, and WT means weaknesses and threats. So if the opportunities and the strengths are high, and the weaknesses and the threats are low, that's the number one box in green, we should be raring to go, we should be embracing those and moving forward on, the, on, on those risk areas. If the opportunities and the strengths are low, but the weaknesses and the threats are also low, then we should challenge ourselves to say, can we ramp up the opportunity? There may be an opportunity lurking in those areas of our business on which we can do better. If the opportunities and the strengths are high and the weaknesses and the threats are also high, then we're probably looking to try and reduce the risk. We are taking too much risk. And then obviously the final quadrant, the one in red, if the opportunities and the strengths are low and the weaknesses and the threats are high, get out of town fast, run away. They are probably the areas we should discontinue doing business in. In terms of the context of embedding risk management, uh, the big key advantages that we would focus, in, focus on, and these are positive words, not negative words, is about improving profitability of the business, improving business efficiency, and improving competitor advantage. And in embedding risk management on our training, one of the things we focus a lot on is the positive side of risk taking. Uh, we're familiar with a lot of the negative attributes of risk management, and rightly so, particularly in the health and safety area. But modern risk management and effective risk management and embedded risk management in, in any organization is about taking positive risk. And taking positive risk, therefore, requires us to make sure that we have mandate and commitment. I'm not going to go through the slides in a huge amount of detail, other than to say somebody from the top needs to be setting the tone, needs to be giving us the mandate so that the business units can actually get on with risk management. And if we look at it on a, on a sort of a, a football type analogy, and the, the producer in the room would know that football wouldn't be my, my, my strength, so he's, he's taught me a, a little bit about which is the forward goal and the back goal. So if you look at it in terms of the various different lines of defence here. The first line of defence, which are, are forwards, I think is the is production department, or is that, is that the technical term? Is that the football term? There it is. Thank you, Ken. Okay. So our, 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 our front line people, uh, our scorers, uh, could be a good name for a good scorer, Ken. Give me. Wayne Rooney. Wayne Rooney. Okay. So the Wayne Rooney's. The, Way, the Wayne Rooney's. They would be our operational managers or our internal controllers, whose job it is to basically land the objectives, land the ball in the net, and I think I'm told that we need to get it in the net that's in front of us, not in the net that's behind us. Is that correct? Thank you, Ken. The midline defence, okay, is the ERM team and the, and the compliance team. Give me a good midline defence name that, that would be known worldwide. Iniesta. Iniesta plays for? Uh, Spain and Barcelona. Okay. And then our defence team, which are our internal auditors and our external auditors, uh, bring up the rear, bring up the mining of the goal. Who would be our who would be our star our star players here? John Terry. John Terry playing for Chelsea and England. Grant. Okay. So a lot of us think in football parallels, okay, and we can very easily relate to this. And by the way folks, most of risk management and the analogies we use and the examples that we use, when you're training this stuff Convert it back to language, to interest, to hobbies that people have. You will find the vocabulary 
in those languages, in the world of sport, in the world of entertainment, in the world of politics, etc., to be able to actually help you identify, okay, first, second, and third line of defence. On the course, we have the 16-step roadmap. Okay, so the good news is we teach it on the on the on on the course, and the better news is we're not going to go into all of the detail of it here on the on the screen today. But there are uh, there are eight horizontal issues uh, which we look at from in terms of and the, the, the W type of questions, folks. What's the issue? What does success look like, or what does good look like for those of you that are trained by me? How will we know when? It, um, how, how will we know it when we see it? What precisely are the measures, etc.? It's the W type of questions that we're asking ourselves to try and figure out how do we approach embedding risk management. And then the, 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 vert the vertical ones, looking at the previous eight and then sort of asking these questions about the previous eight. Do we have capacity? Do we have appetite? Can we take opportunities? Are stakeholders' expectations being managed? Do we have a policy and a framework? Are there roles and responsibilities? Have competencies been identified? And what sort of risk maturity has the organisation? This is one of the things we focus quite a bit in the, in the, in the training, risk maturity. We'll touch a little, little bit on it um, later on. One of the maturity models that we use is an adaptation of the EFQM model, okay, which is a standard business management model. And in that model, we've adopted that slightly so that we actually look at the capacities and the capabilities in the business, which are generally around leadership, people, policy, partners, and processes, how they then lead into results, which is risk handling and outcomes, and then the learnings and the innovation coming from that. And by using that EFQM model, it gives us a methodology, a way of figuring out how we can embed risk. Emer, what's next? John, we have an email in from Katie. Um, Katie writes, Dear John, I am looking for some tools that I can use to help me with risk treatment plans in our organization. We touched on bow ties during the form course. Can you, get, can you go into them in a bit more detail? Katie, very good question. Risk treatment is an area we spend a lot of, a lot of time on. We could, run, we could run courses on that for many a, a periods of time. Um, I picked up this slide in training uh, some time back. And, uh, and I like it because it tells a very good story. We can disappear into all sorts of corners trying to come up with very sophisticated risk treatment tools. But as a fellow once said to me, if the only tool they give you is a hammer, well then you have to treat every problem as a nail and then you just keep beating the nail. Okay, so a lot of it will depend on the tools that are available to you. Risk treatment is so that risks fall in to within desired levels of tolerance implies decision making. Okay, so risk treatment within desired levels of tolerance implies decision making. Okay, and that's the bit that's important. And that's the bit that's around figuring out what is the cost benefit, should we do it, should we not? So will we bother risk treating at all? Now let's just take an example of uh, somebody who wants to procure a progressor, a, a compressor even, a, com a compressor. Okay, so somebody trying to procure a compressor, there are four treatments that are available to you. One is to terminate. Okay? Now we might decide that we can't terminate the underlying activity because it's core to the business. So therefore we will complete. So therefore we do actually have to go ahead and get the compressor. The second, the second treatment then is can we transfer any of the risks associated with that, uh, associated with that? And how could we transfer some of those risks? in relation to procuring this compressor. Well, one would be to make sure that there's an adequate supplier contract, in other words, that we are procuring it from a reputable supplier, and we're effectively transferring some of the risk back to the supplier by making sure that they are adequate um, compressor suppliers. And we could actually take out some business continuity insurance in the event that the installation of the compressor causes some, some problems. Um, we could tolerate the, the, uh, we could tolerate the risk, and the tolerating the risk will fall, in my book, into two categories. One, while we are installing the new compressor uh, and tolerate the old one, and two, as we, to as we implement the new compressor and integrate it into our business, we might tolerate some teething problems. 
Um, the treat is obviously procuring the compressor, okay? And treatment, tre tre treatment uh, solutions, we generally look at them under four categories. Prevent, detect, protect, and correct. And we go into those in a lot more detail um, in training. So they're the typical questions that you'd ask yourself when you get into treatment. Can we look at the treatment in a preventative way? In other words, predictively before it happens? How do we detect what is going on so we can identify what the correct treatment is? How do we protect um, our, ourselves? And then how do we correct? How do we come up with a new solution, i.e. new controls and new processes within, within our organization? Now, typically, the four T's, as we've talked about there, terminate, transfer, tolerate, and treat, they're generally associated with threats within the organization. But of course, as I said earlier on, the organization is really about trying to identify opportunities. So we should really be looking at treatment solutions that have more positive language or more positive words. And the ones we tend to use are, you know, um, open up, own, obliged, and optimize. And we go into that in a lot more detail as we work our way through various different parts of training. So, Katie, the question you asked is, are there tools that we can use? There are loads of tools. The ISO standard actually has a, a substandard uh, hanging out of it that identifies a lot of different treatments that are available to organizations when they are trying to identify risks. The one that I like um, and the one that the IRM uh, likes is the bow tie analysis. And the bow tie analysis has a simplicity to it and it has an ease of understanding. And it can be used in so many different situations. Just looking at the, the bow tie that's available to you there on the screen, as you can see, the big words there are cause and consequence. So on the, the left-hand side in the blue boxes, the causes of, an, of, of, of something happening, and then the consequences of it. And, and in training, the example I use to help people get their head around this is if we put at the middle of that that I've lost my mobile phone. So what might the causes of that be? So it could be careless. I could have exposed. Uh, I could have exposed my my, my phone in a, in a, in, a, in an area. Um, I could have lost it. Um, and then the consequences of it are that um, I mean some of them are very simple. I just lose my phone for a period of time. I can't make calls. I'm on my way to a, late to a meeting, etc. <clears throat> but most modern phones and PDAs have a huge amount of information on them. So if not adequately protected, the person who is now acquired your, your phone has actually now potentially, depending on your password control, access to your bank account, etc. How do we feel about all of that, folks? So the bow tie analysis helps us to look at cause and consequences, and therefore, <coughs> excuse me, as I die here in the studio, my assistant has just handed me a glass of water, I've now recovered, <coughs> is to look at <coughs> the controls. And what are the controls? that we should have in place around the causes? And what are the forward-looking controls that we need to put in place to correct the actions necessary so that the consequences don't continue to happen? We talk a little bit on our training around the triangulation of risk effect, and then we also talk a little bit more about other models and the fishbone one, and it's really the bow tie analysis dressed up in a different way. So, in terms of risk treatments, how would I summarize where we, where, where, where we are <coughs> on risk treatments from the point of view of embedding risk management? On form, we teach you around what the various different treatment types are. On embedding risk management, we get into a lot more detail of the actual models themselves. We use a few more other than the ones that are on the screens here. And we try and tease out what models best fit your organization. So on our training courses, we try and personalize this to what's happening in your organization. So, uh, Katie, I hope that, 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 that helps. Emer, what's next? Um, next up, we have got a text in from Stuart. Um, Stuart writes, John, can you explain why risk appetite is primarily a function of the board? Um, that's text coming in from Stuart. 
Uh, sure, yes, this is, this is, this is a, a perennial one. Risk appetite, folks, is something that organizations are, in my experience, only starting to deal with in more recent times. And I would love to be able to say it's over recent years, but in reality, it's over recent months that people have actually started to look, up, uh, to look at risk appetite in a more serious way. For those of you in the financial services world, I flashed up a slide earlier on about Basel III. A lot of what is in Basel III is about setting risk appetites within, within organizations. I think to understand risk appetite, um, I'm just going to take it up a level for a moment. This thing called agency theory, and agency theory basically talks about the relationship between the members that make up an organization, the board of directors that they appoint to deliver the business objectives on their behalf, and then the manager or the chief executive and his or her team that is appointed underneath that to, uh, to, run, the or to run the organization. Okay. So if we look at that in a slightly different way, we see the members, the board, and the chief executive, and typically within an organization, you will have a series of functions, depending on the type of the organization you have, whether you're a commercial or a not-for-profit, You'll have sales in a commercial organization, or you'll have grants or income in a not-for-profit. You'll have operational functions, and then you will have support functions, the common ones being finance, IT, and HR. So that's the typical structure of agency theory that you would see in many as an organization. And I suppose what we are primarily focused on is the relationship between those, because this governance how we approach risk appetite in the organization. And a good governance model, I've just taken the bottom two pieces of the agency theory, I've taken the board and I've taken the organization, would look something like the following. You'd expect the board to set the tone, the rules, to give example and to set standards, and you expect the organization to show know-how, to report, to early advise and to early warn, and then you'd have communications around, uh, around all of that. Um, so the board is responsible for setting risk appetite. So Stuart, that's the answer to the question. And the balancing act <coughs> that they are employing is setting appetite levels that are high enough to encourage people to go and take risks and setting tolerance levels that are clear, that are easy for people to identify, that they know when they hit up against limits beyond which they're not expected to reasonably go. If you look at it like a dartboard, if you put the organization at the center, the organization will push out into the green zone. It will have an appetite to take a certain number of risks to achieve the business's objectives. At the outside, in the red zone, in the universe of risks, there will be things that will be declared no-go areas. The organization, under no circumstances, will enter into anything that involves them in those risks. And then the amber, or the, the amber area, or the orange area in the middle, is the risk tolerance area, where we prefer not to be, but we drift into from time to time, and that's the area that we need to make sure we have robust controls on so that we can monitor uh, the activity in those, in those areas. Typically, risk appetites in organizations will follow the principles that you see on the screen. Operational issues within your organization, you will typically be seeking to reduce risk in those areas. They will tend to be health and safety types of things. On the extreme right, strategic issues, which are the development of the business, you will typically be looking to increase risks in those areas. Take more risks. Why? Because we want to double profits. We want to increase efficiency. We want to gain market share, etc. And then projects within the organizations will be a combination of the two because within projects there will be specific focus issues where we'll be taking risks in certain areas and we'll be trying to reduce risks in others. So they will be typically the appetites that we will be looking at. And the board will be primarily concerned about three things when they're thinking about risk appetites. They'll be concerned about the financial implications of risks, the disruption or the operational implications of risks, and then the third one will be reputation. Okay. 
the reputation risks associated with, with it. Imer, I know there's another call coming in there. Can I just finish this section out, okay? And we'll take that call down in a, in a, in a, in a second, okay? So they're the bits that, uh, that the, uh, the board would typically, would typically look at, okay? And the board will be asking itself the question, where are we going? And I suppose the, 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 the answer to that is, well, if you don't know where you're going, any road is going to get you there. So therefore, it needs to have a clear vision and there's a management theory around VMOS. We're not going to go into it in a huge amount of detail that says do we have the mission, the vision, uh, the objectives, etc. within an organization. One that we look at uh, on training courses from time to time is, and you can Google this and find it, is the Coca-Cola case study. And you can see that it has set out a mission, and its mission is around to refresh the world, to, uh, to inspire moments of happiness, and to create value, and to make a difference. And then they've broken that out into the division into people on all of their various different P's, the goals, the measures, and the metrics. And you could use a document like that, as, as Coca-Cola do, to drive the risk appetite within an organization, and then to drive risk identification, because clearly on the side you're looking at there, there are risks associated with achieving all of these things, and the question is, what are they? And more importantly, from a risk appetite point of view, how do we feel about all of all of, all of those? So, I suppose, Stuart, wrapping up your question around uh, around risk appetite is a responsibility of the board. Important that it's looked at in terms of opportunities and threats. It's important that it's tied back to the objectives and the mission of the organisation, so that you can quite clearly see the road you're going and the implications of taking the various different the, the, uh, and the implications of taking the various different bits. Um, John, the call um, came in from Pierre. He wasn't able to stay on the line, so he um, tweeted his question. Um, for why is it so hard to put ERM into BAU? So let me translate a little bit. Why is it so hard to put enterprise risk management into business as usual? That's coming in from Pierre. Yeah, I love this slide here. We all go on risk management courses, and we come back fired up, okay, with full of enthusiasm. Uh, and then we actually have to go and implement it, okay? And, uh, and the Gorilla Board with Risk Management potentially represents where we as risk managers sometimes feel when we're about to start implementing risk management into business as usual. Because we're getting the, we're getting the questions like, oh my God, why do I have to do this? Is it not necessary? What we currently have is not brilliant, but it works reasonably well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So what we try, on the embedding risk management course to, uh, to do is to give you some tools around how do you sell risk management within your organization? Um, and to, how do you integrate risk management within your organization? And there's a little selling strategy tool that you see there on your, on your, on your screen. Uh, it's a very useful exercise to actually carry out from time to time. Just to pick somebody, okay, to choose somebody you want to influence. Do a SWOT analysis on your relationship with them. You know, ask yourself, what are you trying to achieve with that person? What are their own objectives? Uh, who do you benchmark with? Who are their peers? You know, what's their current performance indicators? And what does success mean for them? Do they belong to any trade bodies or professional associations or influencing groups like regulatory groups, etc.? And are they subject to any legal requirements? And that sort of questioning and thinking is useful to have in your head when you're sitting down with a person within your organization that you want to influence, to change their behavior, to think about how can we embed risk management in your organization. Because you've got to actually, as the risk manager, go and sell risk management to them. You cannot just issue it out as a directive and say, there you are, thou shalt comply. They won't comply. You've got to sell it. And you're going to end up with a lot of people who've got a lot of different cultures in your organization, and we need to look at the energy behind those cultures. You're going to have people who are well poisoners, okay? People with high energy, but a bad attitude. People with low energy and low attitude, they're the walking dead, okay? We've got people with high energy and high attitude. They're the players. They're the ones that we want to, uh, that we want to be talking to. And then you've got the observers, the ones that you've got to bring along with you. So in terms of embedding risk management and into, into business as usual, 
you need to understand your audience. You need to understand where they are coming from. Uh, so integrating it into business than usual. I think, Pierre, the answer is simple and the delivery is complicated. It's really about understanding the people that you've got to deal with and how do you sell it to them. It's probably a fairly significant part of the course that we run. Or somebody else is on Facebook, I see. Yes, Anne has sent us a message on Facebook. She's uh, following on quite nicely from uh, from the last point you've made there. And she asks, how do I deal with the people, with the whole people bit? I have staff who want direction and board members who want assurance. Um, Tom has helpfully weighed in and, uh, and assured Anne that we're good at what we do, so we'll be able to answer her question. Okay, so what is this, uh, what is this slide got to do with, uh, with that? And I suppose the, the, the key phrases on this slide are risk taking and exercising control and uh, this is a this is a slide that is uh, developed by the IRM and is part of a study that has been done on risk cultures within organizations and the key learning coming out of that is understanding from a people point of view your staff members propensity to take risk versus your staff members' propensity to exercise control. And if you want a good example of that, you think of the, 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 the pilot. I'm not sure if my producer remembers his name. Do you remember the name of the pilot that landed the, the US Airways plane? You're the fountain of all knowledge. It's Steffenberg, I think. Steffenberg, okay. He, Captain um, Steffenberg. Captain, 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 the captain of that US uh, airlines that landed that, that plane in the Hudson River. The organization um, would and was well served by understanding his personal propensity to take risk and his personal propensity to exercise control uh, and to be able to deal with the speed at which risks happened in his organization uh, because at 39,000 feet or at probably at 12,000 feet as he was because this was on a takeoff that this, uh, that this incident arose. He had split seconds to understand, to digest, and to make decisions around what to do next. Now, you may not have, in your organization, the same time pressures that he had, but ask yourself the question, in a crisis, what would your staff members' propensity be to take risks, or your staff members' propensity to exercise controls, and how would they balance the two of those? And that takes us into the whole area of just understanding the people within our organization. The ISO 39000 model takes us through all of the things we need to understand about the theory of risk, the embedding of risk, the implementation of risk within an organization is about understanding how our people are likely to receive risk and to deal with it. One of the tools we use on the training course is the, is, is the Mars Briggs. We look at several different ones where we can look at the different types of personality profiles that we have from the coaches, the crusaders, the explorers, down to the conductors and the scientists. Um, if you haven't done it, log on to, to, to any website, Google Mars Briggs, and do the test. It takes three or four minutes. And it gives you a sense of it's actually reasonably accurate in terms of, of uh, the type of person you are. So if you had that information collected about all of the people who work in your organization, it would very quickly give you a sense or a handle on those people who have a propensity to take risk and those who have a propensity to exercise control. Because you know in your organization, and we're back to the three lines of defense here, who are the ones we want up the front of the pitch? Who are the ones we want in the middle? And who are the ones we want at the back, just making sure that we're not dropping the ball, that we're not letting goals in? So it's important that we do actually understand that relationship with our people. Okay, so that's the first step here of your, of your uh, as a peer, sorry, I'm dealing with the right person, I think I am. Are indeed, yes. yes, I am. yes. Okay. Oh, no, sorry, it's Anne. It's Anne, 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 my apologies, my, 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 my apologies, uh, my apologies, Anne. Um, the second thing you asked, Anne, is in relation to boards and board members and what do they want, and I suppose risk assurance is what board members want. Now, let's be absolutely clear what risk assurance is in an organization and more importantly is not 
risk assurance is the board having an integrated risk assurance system, having clear roles and responsibilities. It's about putting the board in a good place as members' representatives, member agency theory, to holistically understand the effect of uncertainty on objectives. That's the definition of risk, the effect of uncertainty on objectives. It's not about abdicating responsibility. It's not about covering your ass, and it's not, most importantly, about making risk disappear. If we made all of the risks disappear in our organizations, we get rid of our organization. There are many different sources of assurance that the board can, can use, and there's a whole world, or there's a whole universe of them out there. Well, one of the things we try and explore in embedding risk management are what are those sources of assurance. A healthy word of caution on it. I mean, we will get involved in scenario planning, in stress testing, in modeling, uh, and in auditing. But there are celebrated examples in a variety of industries, from insurance where AIG had their difficulties, where technology where eBay had their difficulties, in the world of banking where a, a, a former financial institution known as Lehman Brothers, and we will soon forget the name, uh, got ourselves into difficulties. To the, to, to the, to the well-documented um, oil blowouts and, 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 and platform risks that the Shell organization has had, and how they've had to handle those. So big organizations, just because they have loads of assurance, does not mean they don't have loads of risk, and it doesn't mean that they don't fail as well. So we have to explore that and understand that in a little bit more in a little bit more detail. Thanks, John. That's been a great run through. Um, we might just recap on um, the questions that have come in from Joe, Katie, Stuart, Pierre, and Anne. Yeah. Okay. So, folks. So. What we've covered in the last 40 minutes is a very quick run through some of the issues and some of the problems and some of the challenges that organizations have when they come to embedding risk management in their organization. We started off with Joe and we we're thinking about the context and properly understanding the context of, 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 of risk in an organization. Katie raised some very valid questions around how do we get involved in risk treatment and in particular, we started focusing on some tools we had there, particularly around the bow tie, and there are loads of others. Stuart asked a question around risk appetite and the perennial one, and we talked about the fact that really organizations are now only starting to treat it a little bit more seriously by setting risk appetite standards and by telling people about them. Pierre wants us to know about how to embed it into, into the organization, and we remember that the slide about the, about, about the gorilla who was bored of it at this stage, and now is the time when you're trying to implement, implement it into business as usual, that you actually double your efforts and try and get it in right. And then finally, Anne identified probably for me the most important part of taking risk, for, risk management forward in any organization, and it's about understanding the people you have, understanding the skills and the competencies that they should have, and then identifying the gaps associated with that because it's the people who will run your organization. Just a quick word from our sponsor, because um, it's almost time for us to say goodbye. We run a, a two-day course on embedding risk management several times during the year. Um, whether you think it's a good idea or whether you think it's a bad idea, it'll be me that will be running the next course. It's on the 10th and the 11th of September. It is in London. If you email training at the irm.org, you will get more details on that. I think it's time to say goodbye. Um, Ken, thanks, thanks for all the help on production today. Uh, Emer in the newsroom, as always, we're always interested in what's happening in the World Economic Forum. From me, John Crawley, representing the IRM, thank you for tuning in. I'd love to see you on an embedding risk management course at some <laughs>